What is up guys, welcome to Barton, my name is Heinrich, and today we're finally taking a look at how we're going to deal damage with our attacks. For this episode, we're going to be making use of interfaces, and I'll teach you all about that in just a second. Now, before we get started, I am proud to announce that this episode is sponsored by Shiro. Shiro is a 2D action platformer similar to Metroid or Castlevania, but with the combat speed dial turned up to 11. The game features a very fluid combat system, so you can string together combos and toss in some movement abilities like dashing and wall climbing to master your own playstyle. It is currently being developed by a fellow community member and Unity guru Grem, otherwise known as Shadowlands on the Discord server. Shiro is available for wishlisting on Steam, and there will be a link in the description description. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what an interface is. We're going to focus on just the basics today because we could probably make a whole masterclass just on interfaces and I'm not nearly qualified enough for that. Instead, allow me to explain it to you in the simplest terms that I can. So the Microsoft C Sharp documentation states that an interface contains definitions for a group of related functionalities that a non abstract class or struct must implement. Essentially, what this is saying is an interface allows us to create functions that don't have implementations, but are instead implemented by other classes. A lot of people like to refer to this as contracts, because when a class implements an interface, that class is required to give the functions in the interface an implementation. This also means that when we reference a class that implements a specific interface, it is guaranteed that that class will have those functions. And I'll show you how we're going to make use of that in just a second. But what ends up making this so powerful is we can stop caring about the class that implements the interface and just work with the interface directly. So if that didn't make much sense yet, here we have a little example that I quickly created where I can just show the basics and then we can move on to actually implementing it in our project. Now in this example project here, we simply have our player a crate and an enemy. These three objects have very simple scripts attached to them. Let's quickly go through and take a look at what those are. So we have these three scripts. We have our crate, our enemy, and our player. Let's take a look at our player first real quick. Our player does not have the ability to move. The only thing the script takes care of is reading in mouse input and then playing an animation. So as you can see over here, we get our animator component. In our update, we simply check for input. In our check input function, we read in our left mouse button. If we press the left mouse button, we go to this attack function, which just sets the attack parameter in our animator. And then we simply have two animation triggers. One is for the end of the animation, and one is for the animation action, which is the part where the attack is supposed to deal damage. Now, if we take a look at our crate script, the crate simply has a damage function that logs that the crate is now broken. And our enemy also simply has a damage function that in this case takes in a float amount and prints out how much damage was done to this enemy. So as you can see, super simple stuff. So currently I have it set up. You can see over here, if we run the game and we click, you can see the sword swings and it says, oh, we're attacking. Now, if we just take our enemy, which is simply the enemy script with a box collider 2D set to the damageable layer so that our player can detect it, if we go ahead and just move him a little bit closer and then click, as you can see, it prints 10 damage done to the enemy. Now, if we were to move the enemy away and bring the crate closer and then click, you can see it says the crate is now broken. Oh no. And we can also move the enemy closer again, have both of them right there. Click. Both of these got printed out again. So if we just uncollapse that. 10 damage done to the enemy and the crate is now broken. So what am I trying to demonstrate here? Both these entities that we have over here are damageable by our player, but they do different things when they get damaged. Our enemy's health decreases and our crate simply just breaks. Now, let me go ahead and show you how I currently have the actual damage implemented. Now, just bear in mind, this is not the way that we're going to do it. This is just for demonstration of what we don't want to do. So in this animation action trigger, which is simply just a function that gets called by an animation event on the attack over here, we have a collider 2d array called detected. And we set that equal to our physics 2d dot overlap circle attack transform dot position and attack radius with the what is enemy layer mask. So if we look at our player, we simply have this attack position transform. It's just a circle cast, looks if there's any colliders in that circle, and then adds that to this array. We then go ahead and we create this for each loop that loops through the entire detected array. And then for each item in the detected array, we go ahead and try and see if it contains one of these scripts. 
So we start off and we say create create equals item dot get component create. So we go ahead and look at the first item in detected and we see if it has a create script attached to it. So then we do a check. We say if create does not equal null, then create dot damage. So that means that the entity that we detected, if it has the create script, we're going to call the damage function on that create script. Then we go ahead and see does that entity contain the enemy script. So the same thing enemy enemy equals item dot get component enemy. And if that does not equal null, then call the damage function. Now, as you can see, this works, we can damage both our create and our enemy. But what happens if we want to damage something else, we want to add a new entity that is damageable and has a completely different reaction to being damaged, say it is a lever that we can hit that opens up a door. So the lever being hit is it being damaged, but you know, it doesn't decrease its health, it simply switches the lever to the other position. What we have to do then is come over here and add another block of code like this, that uses the lever script instead. And so for each entity that we add that can be damaged, we have to go ahead and add another block like this. And this means every time that we detect something that could be damaged, we have to do a whole bunch of checks to see if that thing is damaged and then call the right damage function. This is not good. We want to avoid doing this. Now, in previous episodes, I avoided doing this by using the send message function. But that's also not a very efficient way of doing it. So the way we're going to solve this problem to make it so we don't need all of this code to damage something is with the use of our interface. And let's go ahead and create that interface real quick. So I'm going to come back to Unity and just create a new C sharp script. And I'm going to call it I damageable. You don't have to follow along with this. We'll redo this again in the main project in just a second. This is just for demonstration. So let's go ahead and open this up and then get rid of all the code and the mono behavior. And then instead of class, this is going to be an interface. As you can see, the name now changed to a yellow color to indicate that this is an interface. And notice that we start the name with a capital I. This is just to indicate that this is an interface. That way it's easily recognizable. Now, inside the interface, all that we need to do is set up the functions that this interface contains. So we just say void damage, like that. As you can see, we don't have to write public or private or anything like that because in an interface, the function can only be public. Inside this damage function, we can then give it the parameter float amount like that. So now when we damage something, it is required that we pass an amount through. Now what we can do is let's come to our enemy over here. After mono behavior, we can say comma I damageable. So now our enemy inherits from mono behavior and it implements our I damageable interface. So if C sharp, you can only inherit from one class at a time, but you can implement as many interfaces as you want. Now if we come to our create script, and we do the same thing, so make it implement I damageable, you'll see that we'll still get an error. That's because our damage function here does not take in a float. Now, even though our crate does not rely on a damage amount and simply breaks when it gets hit, there's nothing wrong with passing in a damage amount. So let's just go ahead and say float amount, because even though this value is here, it doesn't mean we have to use it inside the function. Now you could go ahead and create a damage that does not take anything in. But really, this is all we need, because when you do damage, you can expect something to want to know how much damage was done. But okay, so now both our crate and our enemy implement I damageable. So how do we make use of this in our player? So if you remember what I just said, as I said, what ends up making interfaces so powerful is that we can stop caring about the class that implements the interface and work with the interface directly. So what I'm going to do is just this code over here. I'm going to comment that out. So now instead of saying create create, I'm going to say I damageable damageable. And I'm going to say that equals to item dot get component, I damageable, like that. And then we can say if damageable does not equal null, then damageable dot damage, and then we pass in our damage amount, like that. Now, it might seem like we just rewrote what we had here. But the thing is, this code accounts for both of these. And then if we were to make another entity that also had a damage function, we don't have to add any code here, because we have this here, it'll work by default. So what this is doing is 
when we're saying item.getComponent i damageable, it looks for any component on the item that implements the i damageable interface, and then we store it in damageable. From there, we can just call the damage directly from this damageable reference that is a reference to the script that implements i damageable. How cool is that? So if we just save this and go back to Unity and try it out, you'll see that if we move our enemy closer and we hit, we still get our 10 damage done to the enemy. And we can do the same thing with the box. This crate is now broken. So anything that we want to damage, all we need to do is make it implement I damageable, and then our player's attack will be able to damage it hit it without having to write any extra code within the player's damage loop itself. So yeah, so that is how we're going to implement damage moving forward. And interfaces are really cool. <laughs> I don't know if my explanation has done it justice, but just in case, I will leave some links to more resources in the description. They're very cool and they're a very handy tool. But yeah, so now let's go ahead and move on to the actual project and let's see how we're gonna implement this for our weapon system there. So this is where we left off our project in the last episode. The first thing we're going to do now is create our I damageable interface. So let's come to our scripts folder and let's create a new folder and we'll just call it interfaces. Inside this folder, let's go ahead and create a new C sharp script and we'll just call it I damageable like before. And let's go ahead and open that up. Now in this script, we can go ahead and delete all this code and get rid of the mono behavior and then change it from class to interface. And then inside the interface, we're just going to create our void damage function that takes in a float called amount. Now, in order to test our damage, we're going to make use of our combat dummy again. But this combat dummy was designed to work with the old combat system. So I'm actually just going to make some changes to it to make it work with the new system. Now, as you can see, we made a prefab out of it. I would like to get rid of it, but I'll still keep the prefab just in case we want to reference it later. To do this, just right click on combat dummy and come over here and say unpack prefab completely. So that means that this game object over here, this combat dummy currently has all the settings and stuff that it had when it was a prefab, but it's no longer linked to that prefab. So if we make changes here, it won't affect our prefab. So the changes I'm going to make to the combat dummy is first of all, I'm just going to get rid of broken top and broken bottom. And actually, I think the only component we really care about is this live game object. So let's go ahead and just drag that up here and then get rid of this combat dummy game object altogether. And we'll just change this alive to combat test dummy. Now we just need to make a new script for our combat test dummy. So let's come back to scripts and I guess we'll put it in enemies. Yeah, here we have our combat dummy controller. So let's just go ahead and create a new c -sharp script and we'll call it combat test dummy. We're not going to be using combat dummy controller anymore, but you know, we can hang on to it for, uh, for reference. You can go ahead and delete it if you want. Okay. So in the combat test dummy script, let's first start off by getting a reference to our animator. So we'll just say private animator anim. And then in our awake function, we'll just say anim equals get component of type animator. Now this is just so that we can play that little damage animation that we had before. And for now, there's really nothing else that we're going to add in here. We'll come back and add our eye damageable later on. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is add our animation action trigger like we had in the example. So the trigger that actually does the damage. So let's come to our weapons folder and open up our weapon script. And now in here, we can come to our animation triggers region. And at the bottom of that, let's just go ahead and add another public virtual void animation action trigger like that. So now inside this animation action trigger is where we're going to put the code that does the logic when we want to hit something. But we don't want this in our base weapon script. If I go ahead and open up this diagram that we had before, you can see that from our weapon script, we're going to both have a defensive weapon and an aggressive weapon. And our defensive weapon does not do damage with the animation action trigger. It might not even use the animation action trigger. So we need to go ahead and create our aggressive weapon script. So let's come back to unity. 
and then right click in the weapons folder, create C sharp script, and we'll just call this aggressive weapon. And then go ahead and open that up. Okay, so in this aggressive weapon script is where we're going to override our animation action trigger. So let's get rid of that code and then make it inherit from weapon instead. So in here, we can then just write override, hit space, and then it should give us all the functions that we can override. We just want our animation action trigger. And there we go. Now, before we add anything else in this function, let's just go ahead and set up our animations to actually call this trigger. So remember that our animations can't call these functions directly and we have to make use of this intermediary instead. So let's go ahead and open that up. Weapon animation to weapon. And then in here, we just add private void animation action trigger like that. And then we just say weapon dot animation action trigger. Perfect. Now let's come back to unity and we're going to add that trigger to all of our animations. But before we do that, I just want to fix my <laughs> weapon animation timing. So as you'll see, the attacks are quite quick. The frames are evenly spaced. I don't like this and I was lazy in the previous episodes, but you know, let's just go ahead and do that now. So we're currently looking at base sword one. What I want to do is I want to make this anticipation frame last a little bit longer and then this recovery frame as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select all of these frames and I'm just going to move them one over and then don't forget to do the same with the animation events at the top. So select them, drag them one over like that. And then we have these two impact frames and then the recovery frames. So I want this final impact frame to last one frame longer. So I'm gonna select these, move them over one, and then don't forget to select the animation triggers like that, or the animation events, sorry. So now if we play this, I don't know, for me it just feels like the attack has a little bit more impact and it's not quite as aggressively fast. So while we're here, we can also come to this impact frame over here and add another animation event. And we're just going to select our animation action trigger. Now we also need to come and do the same thing for these other two animations as well. So we'll go to base sword two, we'll select all of these animation frames. Unfortunately, we can't select the events at the same time, which is kind of a bummer but it's okay, we'll live with it. Move it over, select the final two, and move them over as well. There we go. And let's come and add our animation event, which is our animation action trigger. Okay, and then we need to come and do it with base sword three. So we'll select all these frames drag them over, select the animation events, drag them over, select the final two frames, drag them over, and then the animation events again. Okay, and then come to our impact frame, add an animation event, and select animation action trigger. Perfect, okay. Now, unfortunately, we also have to come and do the same thing with our weapon animations. So we'll come and look at weapon sword one, select all the frames except the first one, drag them over one, select the final two frames, drag them over one. At least in this case, we don't have any animation events. So we'll come to sort two, select the frames, drag them over, select the last two, drag them over, and then our last one. Just like that. Okay, so there's the timing fixed. Uh, when I add new animations, I'll make sure I do the timing before we move on, just so we don't have to do this again, but cool. So now our animations have the correct timing and we have our animation action trigger added. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about our weapon hitbox. How are we gonna handle that? In the example at the start of the episode, I was just using a physics 2D dot overlap circle. So that required us to give a position and a radius. Now that'll work, but unfortunately that's quite a lot of extra setup that we have to do for our weapon data. So we have to specify the center point of the attack and the radius of the attack. Instead, what we're gonna do is we're going to add a collider on our weapon script 
that our weapon is going to animate. What that means then is we can have any shape collider that we want. If we just come to our weapons, uh, our weapon game object over here and say add component and we just look for collider, you'll see that we have box collider 2D, capsule collider 2D, circle collider 2D, polygon collider 2D. All of these collider 2Ds all inherit from the same base collider 2D component, which means that we can use all of them here and our code can work with any of them. But for simplicity, I'm just going to use this box collider 2D. What we're then going to do is animate this box collider to follow our weapon. So when we attack, we put this box collider where we want to do the damage. That way we don't have to specify any of these shapes in our weapon data. All of it sits on the animator. And then in just a second, I'll show you how we're going to use this collider as the actual hitbox. So before we do that, let's just go ahead and animate this box collider. We'll come over to our weapon sword one animation and then we simply need to hit the record button and then we come over here and edit our collider and let's just change the shape to fit our sword now the frames where we're not doing damage aren't super crucial but i'll show you when we actually do the damage why this might be a good idea because this will allow us to maybe use weapons that do damage for more than a single frame maybe it's a slow hammer that when it swings it can hit a bunch of enemies along its arc things like that so let's just animate this box collider to fit the weapon nicely so in this frame you can see we swing this is the frame where we're actually doing damage so let's say we want to be able to do damage all along this part over here because we swing like this so anything that was over here should be damaged i'm actually just going to move it like this so in this case i'm only going to damage things that are in front of me okay and then in this frame it comes a little bit down like this it's not too crucial we can always edit this later and in the last frame we have it like this so you'll see now when we play the animation you can see the collider changing shape with our attack cool let's do it for our second animation so in here hit record let's get it to line up with our sword like this and then we have our attack itself now the collider doesn't have to line up with the front of the sword completely you can give it any reach that you want i'm just gonna put it like that and then like this Okay, so I'm just going to animate through the rest of this. You can do the same thing on your side. Okay, perfect. So there the box collider animation fits my sword. But you'll notice over here, these frames that we opened up where we moved the, the frames one over, the box collider is moving when we don't really want it to. So we should actually just go through and also add them to this correct position. Like that. Okay, now it fits the sword better. Let's fix the other ones as well. Okay, so now all three of our attack animations has this collider attached to it. Now, you might also be wondering why am I adding the collider on the weapon game object instead of the base game object? The reason I'm doing this is in case we have different swords, so say we have a sword 2 that has a little bit of a longer sprite, I might want to give it some extra reach. So this way our collider is going to be weapon dependent and not weapon type dependent. Okay. So now that we have that set up, we have our collider and we have our animation event. What are we going to do next? Next, we're going to talk about how this hitbox system is actually going to work. So instead of using our physics 2D dot overlap circle or overlap box or whatever, we're going to make use of the on trigger enter 2D and on trigger enter or exit 2D uh, functions that are built into Unity. So let me actually explain that a little bit better real quick. Let's say we're looking at our attack one. If we follow this animation, you can see that this box collider is set like this. Now, let's pretend that this enemy is standing in front of the player and he and the player is trying to hit him. So, boop. At a certain point, this box collider is going to overlap with this enemy's collider. 
we look at that, he has this collider attached to him. That means that there's going to be an on trigger enter 2D event being fired off. So what we're going to do is on the weapon, we're going to have a list of enemies that are currently inside of our hitbox. So whenever that function gets called, an enemy is going to get added or removed from that list. And then when the animation action actually happens, our weapon is going to go and look at that list, see which enemies are within its collider, and then just damage all those enemies. I hope that makes sense. If not, hopefully it will when we start implementing it. So let's come to our aggressive weapon script. What we're going to do here is at the top, we're just going to declare a private list and the list type is going to be I damageable. And we're just going to call it detected damageables. We're going to set this equal to a new list of type I damageable. So a list you can almost think of as an array, but it does not have a set size, it's dynamic. So you can add as many items to it as you want. That's handy because that means we can dynamically increase the size as we add more entities that can be damaged. Now we're never really expecting to have more than one or two entities within the hitbox, but it's nice to have that option. Next, we're gonna go ahead and create two functions to add and remove entities from this list. So we'll have a public void and we'll just call it add to detected like that. And this function is going to have an input parameter of type collider 2D called collider like that. And now the reason we're using collider 2D is because if we just go ahead and say on trigger enter 2D, you'll see that this function takes in a collider 2D collision. Actually, let's change this to collision as well like that. And so we're just going to pass this on from our on trigger enter 2D to our add to detected, but not from the script from our weapon. So next we need to have a public void remove from detected like that. And that's also going to take in a collider 2D called collision like that. So now inside this add to detected, what we want to do is we want to look at the collision see if it has an eye damageable component and then if it does add it to this list so in here we just say eye damageable called damageable equals collision dot get component of type i damageable like that same way we did it in the example and then we just say if damageable does not equal null then detected damageable dot add and we're just going to add damageable because our damageable is of type i damageable and that is the type of our list so now when something is inside of the hitbox it gets added to this list and then to remove it we have the exact same code so let's just go ahead and copy and paste this but instead of add we're going to use remove like that so now where are we going to call this add to detected and remove from detected from well, we said that our weapon has this box collider 2D and when something enters this box collider 2D, we want to add it to that list. So we need to make another intermediary script that's going to sit on our weapon game object that is going to pass that information onto our weapon itself that sits on our sword. So let's come back to our intermediaries folder, which is in scripts, intermediaries. And let's go ahead and create a new C-sharp script. We're going to call it weapon hitbox to weapon like that. Let's open that up. And now in here we can get rid of this code. And now the only thing that we need in here is going to be our private aggressive weapon. And we'll just call it weapon like that because our defensive weapons aren't going to have a hitbox. You know, we're not doing damage with it, so it doesn't really matter. So we have our private aggressive weapon. Then we just need to set this reference. So we'll say private void awake. In here we say weapon equals get component in parent. And the component we're looking for is our aggressive weapon. So now that we have this reference to our aggressive weapon over here, which holds our public void add to detected and public void remove from detected, we can call those functions. So back in our weapon hitbox script, we're just going to say on trigger enter 2D, 
So this means that another collider has entered the collider that is attached to the same game object that this script is setting on. And actually this reminds me real quick, as you can see, we're saying on trigger enter, that means we need to come back to our weapon over here and set this box collider 2D to a trigger. Okay, so back in here, private void on trigger enter 2D, all we say is weapon dot add to detected collision. So we're simply passing on this collision information from our on trigger enter 2D to our weapon, and then it will determine if it should be added to the list or not. Next, we can go ahead and say on trigger exit 2D, like that, this should be private void. And then all we say is weapon dot remove from detected collision. Okay, so let's just go ahead and test this to see if it works. What I'm gonna do is inside of these uh, trigger functions, I'm just gonna add a couple of debug statements so that we can take a look at our console and see if everything's working. So we'll just say debug.log, whoops, debug.log. And in here, I'm just gonna say on trigger enter 2D like that, copy that, paste that in here, change this to on trigger exit like that. And then let's come to the aggressive weapon. And so here we have these two functions. So let's go ahead and add some debug statements in here. So now instead of this, I'm just gonna say add to detected. And then here I'm gonna say remove. So remove from detected like that. And then let's just go ahead and add one inside of the if statement as well so that we can confirm. I'm gonna say added and removed. Okay, so this is just going to be a nice way to test it. Okay, so let's try it out. Let's come back to Unity and let's just run the game. Now, as you can see by default, our sword has been set to inactive. So let's just click on that and activate that again. And you'll see that if we click on weapon and turn on gizmos, we can see the collider. Whoops, let's turn that back on. There's our collider. So let's just take our combat test dummy and open up our console. And let's move it into that collider, which is about around over here. So if I move this over, nothing is happening. <laughs> Why is nothing happening? Okay, I think we have a layers issue. Let's take a look. Our sword is currently set to our player layer and our combat test dummy is set to our damageable layer. So let's come to edit, project settings and look at our physics 2D settings. Over here you can see that our player cannot interact with our damageable layer. So that means our on trigger enter and our on trigger exit will not get cold. So what I wanna do is come over to our layers and add a new layer and I'm just gonna call it weapon like that. I'm then gonna come and click on my weapons game object and I'm gonna set the layer to weapon and it's going to ask if I want to change the layer for all of its children. I'm gonna say yes. And as you can see, we now have this weapon layer added to our physics 2D matrix. So what I'm gonna do is I want my weapon to be able to interact with only damageable. So I'm gonna deselect all of this like that. And now only damageable is selected. So our weapon is set to weapon, so it should work now. Let's try it out. So if I come and I enable my sword again, and I clear this, and then I select my combat dummy. If we move it a little bit closer. <laughs> ah! Oh, you know what? Turns out I'm kind of stupid. Okay, so <laughs> we also need to come and add our weapon hitbox to weapon script to our weapon. Ha, ah, okay. This time it should work, let's try it out. As you can see, we got this on trigger enter 2D uh, debug statement, but then we have a null reference exception error and I know what it is. That's because on our sword one, we still have our weapon script attached instead of our aggressive weapon. So let's just go ahead and remove this component and add our aggressive weapon. And now we just need to add our data back in like that. And so because we added this aggressive weapon script here now, that just means we need to come and click on our player and add the weapon back into our inventory. 
because it lost that reference. So click on player and then drag sword one in there. Okay, <laughs> let's see, what is this attempt number five? It should work now. Um, click on sword one, enable that, come to scene, clear the console, click on the dummy, and let's drag that over. Cool, okay, so as you can see, on trigger enter 2D is called, and then add to detected. But note that added did not get called. And that's because our combat dummy does not yet have the eye damageable interface. But as you can see now, if we pull it back slowly, boop, on trigger exit 2D gets called and remove from detected get called. Okay, let's go ahead and come back to our combat dummy script over here. And let's just make it implement our eye damageable. That also means that we have to implement the interface, which if it gives you this error, a quick way to implement it is just to hit control full stop. It might be a different shortcut for you, but then you can just go ahead and say implement interface. And what it's going to do is it's going to generate the function and then it's going to add this throw new system dot not implemented exception in there. We can just go ahead and get rid of that. That's just there to give you an exception if you try and run the program without actually having put code in there. It's just to save you from generating a bunch of interfaces and then forgetting to actually implement those interfaces. But for now, we're not gonna use this damage function yet. Let's just go back to Unity, make sure this is saved. And so now back in Unity, you can see we have not yet added the combat dummy script over here. So let's go ahead and add that. It's combat test dummy and not combat dummy controller. Let's run the game and try it out. Cool, so as you can see, when we enter that collider area, we have our on trigger enter 2D, add to detected and added. So that means the list now has a reference to the combat dummy. And so then if we pull it back, you can see we get our on trigger exit 2D, remove from detected and removed. Perfect, so our hitbox is now able to detect entities that can be damaged. Let's move on. Okay, so now that we have a list of all the entities inside the hitbox, how are we gonna damage them? Let's come back to our aggressive weapon. And we have this animation action trigger function. Now, what I'm gonna do is create a private void function called check melee attack. And I'm simply gonna call this from our animation action trigger. You don't have to do this. I'm just doing this for my own organization. And now inside of this check melee attack function is where we're going to loop through this list and then just simply call the damage function. So what we can say in here is just for each. And then if you hit tab, it'll auto complete it for you and you can now just change the variable names. So we want I damageable item in detected damageable. So this is going to loop through every reference in our detected damageables. And then in here, we can just simply call the damage function. So we'll say item dot damage. Now our damage function does require us to give a float damage amount. So let's go ahead and set up our data for this weapon. So currently if we come over here to our scriptable objects folder and then our weapons folder and take a look at our weapon data, our weapon data is going to follow a similar structure to our weapons itself. So we have weapon data, defensive weapon data, aggressive weapon data, hold weapon data that all inherit the same pattern as the actual weapon itself. So let's come back to Unity. Let's come to our scriptable objects folder and then our weapons folder. And let's go ahead and create a new C sharp script. And this is going to be SO underscore aggressive weapon data. And let's go ahead and open that up. And then in here, we can get rid of this code. And now instead of inheriting from mono behavior or scriptable object, we're going to inherit from scriptable object weapon data like that. Now we're gonna make a little bit of a change to what we currently have in our weapon data over here. We currently have this public float array movement speed that allows us to define a movement speed for each of the attacks. What we're going to do is we're gonna incorporate this into the data for each attack. For this, we're also going to make use of structs again. Now, if you remember earlier in the series, we created this uh, attack detail struct that we used we're going to make another one of these. We're not gonna be using this one anymore, so we can probably get rid of it at some point, but just to not break anything else for now, because our enemies still make use of this, we'll create a new one. So we'll say public struct, and this one I'm just gonna call weapon attack details. Like that. Now, in here, we're going to define each of the things that a specific attack 
needs. We're gonna start off with public string called attack name. Now, this is not strictly necessary, but this does allow us to change the way that it's displayed in the inspector a little bit. So you can skip this part if you don't want it, but I'll show you something cool that we can do with that. Next, we're going to add our public float movement speed, like that. And then finally, we're going to add a public float damage amount. So what we're gonna do now is come to our aggressive weapon data scriptable object. And then in here, all we say is serialized field, private weapon attack details, like that. And we want an array of this because we want a weapon attack details for each of the attacks. And we'll just call it attack details. Also, before we forget, let's go ahead and add our create asset menu to the top over here. So our file name is going to be new aggressive weapon data. And then our menu name is going to be data forward slash weapon data forward slash aggressive weapon. Like that. Okay, so now we have this aggressive weapon data that is specific to our aggressive weapons. That means we need a reference to the aggressive weapon data in the aggressive weapon. So let's come to this class and at the top, let's just go ahead and declare a protected SO underscore aggressive weapon data. And we'll just call it aggressive weapon data. And now how are we gonna set the reference to this data? So if we take a look at our weapon script and come up to the top, you can see over here we have this private SO weapon data that has serialized field in front of it. That is why if we come to our sword one over here, we're able to drag this data and drop it in over here. So in our aggressive weapon, we could do the same thing. We could put serialized field in front here, but then what happens is we're gonna have two blocks over here for each one of those variables. But at the end of the day, those variables end up being a reference to the same thing, the same scriptable object asset in our memory. So we don't wanna drag in both of those all the time. And so if we follow that approach, that means the further down this tree we get, the more of these data objects we're just gonna have to drag in. It's, it doesn't make any sense. Instead, we can leverage the fact that we know that aggressive weapon data inherits from weapon data and that our weapon has weapon data. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna leave our weapon data as this one with the serialized field in front of it over here. We just need to change it from private to protected. And then we can go ahead and upcast this weapon data to aggressive weapon data. So we have this data in here in our aggressive weapon. We're just gonna look at that data, see if it is aggressive weapon data. And if it is, we're just gonna put that in here. And we're just gonna do this in the awake function. Now, if we take a look at our weapon, actually over here, we're making use of start. This should be awake like that instead. So then in our aggressive weapon, we'll just come and say override awake like that. And now in here we'll say if weapon data, so this is now referring to this weapon data. So if weapon data dot get type. And so what this is going to do is get the type of the thing that this is referencing. So we might say, oh, it's just going to return scriptable object wep weapon data. But no, this weapon data can hold a reference to our aggressive weapon data. Wait, over here, our aggressive weapon data, because our aggressive weapon data inherits from weapon data. So this dot get type if the data is aggressive weapon data, will return aggressive weapon data. So we can say if weapon data dot get type equals equals type of, and then in here we say so underscore aggressive weapon data. So if the type that gets returned from weapon data is the same as this weapon data, then that means we have the correct data and we can go ahead and upcast it. So then we just say aggressive weapon data equals brackets, scriptable object, underscore aggressive weapon data, weapon data. 
So what this is going to do is it's going to set this reference to weapon data because we know weapon data holds a reference to a scriptable object, aggressive weapon data. So this means now that our base weapon place is the only place where we add the data and then it'll upcast itself to whatever script is currently attached to the weapon. So that means we should also just add a little check in here because if we have the aggressive weapon script attached to that game object, but the data is not for aggressive weapon, we wanna let the, the designer know. So we'll just say debug dot log error, and we'll just say wrong data for the weapon, like that. Okay, so now our aggressive weapon has a method to get its data, and we have created this aggressive weapon data, but currently if we come back to Unity, we're still busy using just base weapon data. So let's actually just for now get rid of this error, and and let's test it out and make sure that we actually get uh, that error. So if we run the game, you'll see, oh, wrong data for this weapon. Now, if we come to our data folder and our weapons folder inside of that, and let's go ahead and create data, weapon data, aggressive weapon, and I'm just gonna call this sword. So you can see our sword contains this data, but currently we can only see movement speed. That comes from our base weapon data. Why don't we see this attack details? And that's because we simply need to come to our attack details uh, struct over here. And before we declare the struct, just open up some square brackets and then say system.serializable. Now by doing this, we're basically making it so that Unity can display this in the inspector. So if we come back to Unity, you can see over here now we have this attack details and it's an array, so we can do the same thing. We can say, okay, we have three attacks, and now each one of these elements has these different variables. Now, before we actually put the data in here, let's just come back to our sword one, and let's drag the sword data in here. As you can see, even though this weapon data is scriptable object underscore weapon data, we can put this aggressive weapon data there because it inherits from it. If we run the game, we don't get that error. So that means that this code over here is working, perfect. Okay, so our data might be getting a little bit confusing currently because we have this attack details that has a movement speed uh, variable and our base weapon data also has this movement speed array. So which one are we actually going to use? Well, so the thing is we wanna have this at both places because with our aggressive weapon data, we want to be able to say how many attacks we have by setting the array size and then set all the variables for each attack in one place. We don't wanna have separate lists of arrays that we need to set the size each time and then go set the different variables. We wanna keep it nice and contained. But the problem is we can't just get rid of this movement speed over here because if we look at our base weapon script, we make use of that. If we click on weapon data over here, you can see over here, we're using weapon data.movementspeed.length for resetting our attack counter. We're using it to get the velocity to actually set. And we can't use the movement speed from our aggressive weapon data because the base weapon does not have a reference to that. And we can't guarantee that it's going to use aggressive weapon data. So what are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna leave this data here, but we're just gonna add a public getter and a protected setter at the end. And what that means is if we come back to Unity over here, you'll see that that movement speed array has disappeared. Now, how are we gonna actually set these values? Well, I'll show you that in just a second. Before we do that, let's just go ahead and add another variable over here. And that's going to be a public int called amount of attacks, like that. And we'll also give it the public getter and the protected setter. Okay, so how do we get this data over here? Well, we're gonna do this in our aggressive weapon data scriptable object. So we have access to an on enable function. Basically, the on enable function gets called at the start of the game. So it basically serves the same purpose as awake in our normal scripts. Now note that the scriptable objects does have an awake function, but it doesn't work the same way as a normal scripts awake function. It doesn't get called every time the game starts. Instead, it gets called when the scriptable object gets created. So we're not gonna use awake, we're gonna use on enable, like that. Private void on enable. So this means every time the game starts, this code is going to get called. Now, 
we can use this to set these values. So we'll just go ahead and say amount of attacks is equal to attack details dot length. Perfect, because the amount of attacks that we have is the size of this array. Next, we can go ahead and initialize this array. So we can say movement speed equals new float. And the size that we want is going to be amount of attack. This should actually be amount of attacks. So let's just go ahead and rename that. So amount of attacks, perfect. And then we can just go ahead and loop through our attack details and copy over the movement speed from this variable to this variable. So we'll just say four, and then if we hit tab, it'll auto complete it. So in this case, it was tab twice. Um, so we can say four int i equals zero. i is less than our amount of attacks. And then inside the for loop, we just say movement speed i equals attack details i dot movement speed. Perfect. So that means now every time the game starts, it's going to look at this data and copy the relevant things over to the previous data. So this over here. Let's just quickly come back to our weapon and fix some things over here. So in our enter weapon, we're making use of this over here to reset the counter. So instead of weapon data dot movement speed dot length, we're just going to use amount of attacks. And then everything else should still work. I think this reference is still working perfectly. Awesome, let's save this and quickly take a look, make sure we don't have any errors. Perfect. Okay, so now we're ready to make our aggressive weapon script actually use this data for the attack. The problem currently is I actually set this up to be serialized field private. That means that our aggressive weapon cannot access this data. But we also don't want to leave this public. I know I've been leaving this public uh, in a lot of things, but you know, that's not good. That means we can change it from outside when we don't want to. We want this data to be set. It's set in stone. We don't want to change it. How do we get around this? Well, we can do the same thing that we did for our core. So we'll leave it like this. And let's go ahead and create a public weapon attack details array. And we'll just call it attack details with a capital A this time. And then we'll just say get gives us our lowercase attack details. And set means that attack details equals value. Perfect. So now we can reference our attack details from our aggressive weapon. So in here in our check melee attack function, we want to deal damage. So the first thing we need to do is make sure we're working with the correct details. So what I'm going to do over here is I'm going to create a weapon attack details. And I'm just going to call it details. And I'm going to set this equal to our aggressive weapon data dot attack details. And I'm going to use our attack counter. So then inside over here, instead of 10 F, we can say details dot damage amount. Okay, so let's quickly go ahead and test it and make sure everything worked. <laughs> I hope it did. Boop. Well, our add and remove is working, but I don't think we actually added anything to our damage function in our combat test dummy yet. Yep, no, it's empty. See, that's why that uh, exception would have uh, worked nicely. So in here, let's just go ahead and say debug.log. And I just want to say amount plus damage taken. Like that. Let's go ahead and try that out. And so actually, I'm busy getting ahead of myself. We didn't actually set the data up yet. So let's just go ahead and set the movement speed for our first attack to three. And then the second attack, I want to make that four. And then the last attack, I want to make that two. My damage amount then is going to be 10, 15, and 20. And so now I can also quickly show up the reason we put this attack name over here. So as you can see, our attack details currently, it's an array of size three, and we have three different elements, and it's currently called element zero, one, and two. Now if we open this up, and we just say slash attack one, you can see the element name changes to this first string. Now it's important that the string has to be the first uh, variable in the struct. If it was the second one, this would not work. This just makes it a little bit easier. If we had very specific attacks and we're going through the details looking for a specific attack, we can see it like this a lot easier. So actually, 
instead of slash tag one, I'm gonna say left slash, element one is then our right slash, and element two is my up slash. It's almost like an uppercut with the sword. Okay, so let's see if this works. If I hit the dummy and look at the console, there's quite a lot of stuff over here. But as you can see, we have this 10 damage taken. Perfect. Let's actually just go ahead and get rid of most of these comments. We don't really need them anymore. It was just to make sure that everything worked, which it does. So there's this, and then in the aggressive weapon, there's this, like that. And I think for now we can actually also comment out this uh, state thing. That's also just handy to make sure we know what state we're currently in when we're debugging. But we're not debugging, so, so everything's good. Okay, boop, 10 damage taken, 15, 20, perfect. And as you can see, our movement speed is also working. Awesome. Okay, so there we're dealing damage to our uh, combat dummy. Let's just go ahead and make that feel a little bit better like before. So let's just come to our test dummy script, which is currently over here. And let's create a serialized field private game object. And we'll just call it hit particles. And then in our damage function, we'll just say instantiate hit particles on our transform.position with quaternion dot Euler. And we want a random rotation. So we'll say 0.0f, 0.0f. And then for our z rotation, we're gonna say random dot range. No, random dot range. And we just want a random value between 0.0f and 360.0f, like that. And then we can also go ahead and say anim.set trigger. And the trigger we wanna set is our damage trigger. Now, these are things that we set up the first time we worked with the combat dummy, so we can just reuse it. We'll come back to Unity, click on our combat test dummy. And over here we have our hit particles, so we'll come to our prefabs folder and just drag in this hit particle. Let's try it out. There we go. There we have a little bit more feedback that wasn't completely necessary, but hey, it makes it feel a little bit better. Well, there you go, guys. So that's how we're dealing damage. We're using interfaces. It's a really powerful method. Currently, we're only damaging one thing. So, you know, there's not really much to show. But once we start adding different enemies and start adding things like crates and buttons and other things that need to get damaged, this is a very good method to use. So I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. I hope I managed to teach you something. If you're confused about anything, like always, feel free to reach out in the comments or on Discord. And don't forget to go wishlist Shiro on Steam. And so before I go, I would also just like to say thank you to all of my supporters and wonderful people over on Patreon. And a huge special thank you to Pyro Says, Cody Lee, Binary Chef SA, Jeremiah Miranda, Klian Vastner, Samoon, Alex, and TomTom Tom for your support on Patreon. You guys are absolute mad lads and I really appreciate it. And yeah, I'll see you guys in the next episode. I hope you guys all have a wonderful day.